series. Um, I want to do a quick introduction to a couple things and then we'll dive in with our speaker Alana today. Um, first thing I wanted to mention is that we do have automated captioning for today's event. Um, so if you go to the top part of your screen, you'll see uh, go live or live streaming with Otter AI. If you click on that, it'll have another screen that pops up that will have the transcript of today's event. I think it got some of the lyrics too from the song, which is fun just before this. If you on your phone it'll copy the URL and then you'll have to open it in a new browser. Um, so those are transcripts that you can have open um, on another screen just to follow along with with what we're saying uh, this afternoon. And we will also be recording the event. So we'll um, write up a blog post and send out the blog and the recording um, in a couple of days. And so uh, really glad to have you all here. Um, this event was created out of, um, after talking to different folks in the Women Talk Design community, I recently had a lot of conversations with our workshop alumni and speakers about um, how it is, what it is that Women Talk Design could be doing to best support them. And we heard folks wanting to hear more from the amazing speakers in our community. Um, I heard from folks who really wanted to understand better how to get started speaking. And while they appreciated speaking, hearing from professional speakers and in some of our Q&A's really wanted to hear from you know speakers who had more recently had their first speaking engagements or um, were doing different types of speaking and so we put together this series to a couple accomplish a couple different goals uh, one is as I mentioned to really highlight this amazing group of speakers that we have um, all different backgrounds all different types of speaking experiences from all over the world um, the second piece is to really give you a chance to ask your questions about how our speakers got started, um, you know, how they find speaking events, what they're speaking about, whatever questions you might have and come to mind. And then finally, we really wanted to give folks an opportunity to connect with one another as well. That's a really important part of a lot of our events is giving you chances to meet others in the community. And so um, at the end of the session, we'll have time to break out um, and have a couple prompts for you all to talk to one another and meet other people in the Women Talk Design community. Um, I do want to give a special shout out to Adobe XD. They um, are a really wonderful sponsor of Women Talk Design. And thanks to them, um, we're able to offer free tickets to this event and also provide our captioning. So um, big shout out to XD. And um, now I'm you know, excited to have us get started. So I'm going to introduce Alana. Uh, we'll dive into a couple of questions that I have prepared, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So please start thinking about what questions you have for Alana. Um, so it was really, really thrilled to have Alana Washington as our first feature uh, for our Women Talk Design speaker series. Alana is a design leader, a strategist, and researcher. She is currently leading design operations at Uber Freight but was previously a strategy director of data experience design at Capital One. And in that role, she worked alongside design leaders to build out a data experience design practice to partner with engineers and business managers working on some of the most challenging problems in AI. And during her time there, she led a fairness in AI initiative to really pull together stakeholders from across the organization to unify and amplify Capital One's thought leadership in the space. Alana is driven by innate curiosity to help others solve unsolvable problems and to create solutions that are genuinely impacting people's lives. And Alana holds a master's degree in industrial and organizational psychology from NYU. Uh, she's been featured in Envision's six of the most influential women in UX today, 28 Days of Black Designers. And she's currently a conference curator for the Design Operations Summit that's coming up later this year. And has spoken at conferences and festivals and events, um, including most recently keynoting SF Design Week's Six Tips for Surviving a Racism Pandemic. So please, if you can, um, you can unmute right in the chat please help me welcome Alana. Yay. <laughs> Hi, I'm stoked to be here this morning. So happy to have you, Alana. Um, and I'd love to start off, just my first question is, I want to hear more about what you are most um, interested in and excited about speaking uh, about these days. I know you recently gave your opening keynote of six tips for surviving the racism pandemic, but you know, if anyone was asking you, what is it that you want to speak about? What do you you care most about talking about right now and why? Um, so it's a, a tad bit radical, but um, I actually have like a shameful, a, not a shameful, but I, if I could do it all over again with SF Design Week, if I had had more time to prepare and we can get into that, 
Um, I definitely would have spent more time centering Black and Latinx women and non-binary voices as like the kind of core content for that talk. And I think that in the future, when I'm thinking about how I'm solving the problems of my work and solving problems of the world, um, that is like my absolute dedication to future talks moving forward. And that means that um, even though I feel like I had already started to um, delve into doing the work and doing the reading and doing the foregrounding, I could be even better at it. Um, and so I actually, um, I had joined Uber Freight to uh, kind of head design operations there and have now um, accepted a role. I'm stepping into a role of heading the shipper design team. Um, and so we'll be looking at kind of the future of small, medium business all the way up through enterprise shippers um, as we build products for them. Um, and so very much we'll be trying to be a bit radical um, with kind of who is designing the artifacts and the tools um, and the ways I go about thinking how we kind of serve in that space. So future talks for me, we'll probably be doing a lot more foregrounding um, of other voices. Awesome. I love that. And I, I want to hear more about, I know you alluded a bit to your experience um, preparing for your last talk. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. I want to actually um, take a step back for a bit and hear about your first speaking engagement. So if you can think back to what was the first time that you were speaking professionally um, and what was that experience like? Maybe how did you, how did you get the speaking engagement um, and anything else you remember from it? Yeah, I mean, I got, it's funny, I, not funny, but I, as I was concluding my master's, I had the opportunity to take an internship at HBO, and that internship then grew into a full-time position, which was really exciting, um, and I joined the organizational effectiveness team, which kind of had two branches. We did um, executive coaching and um, like leadership development series. And then we also did training and development for employees, which was huge to have a company about the size of HBO, have a dedicated learning and development team. And I found that I really had a passion for facilitating some of the courses. I had a really great uh, sponsor and boss, um, Chris Williams, who basically like, you know, had me watch a couple of times he'd give a class and then he'd say, now you take the reins. Um, and so I think what was even cooler for me is that my professional speaking began as facilitation not even just kind of speaking to an audience like there was there's a choreography to it and there is the ability to give adults the opportunity to practice the soft skills that you're teaching about um and so yeah that kind of began it and then i mean by the end of my tenure there i was teaching everything from like you know classes that had already been done for some time emotional intelligence etc all the way up through crafting new classes that i would teach um leading for teams and and things like that and was teaching probably two to three days a week um and then made the pivot to starting to do more kind of like on stage speaking engagements as I switched to design and that made more sense. Awesome. Yeah. And, and as you started to speak externally, um, I'm curious how you found those speaking engagements, if there've been things that you've sought out or um, people have come to you and how you made the decision of where to speak and when to say yes, when reached out to. Um, I mean, I have to say I attribute so much of that to you and Women Talk Design. I feel like I, um, you're an incredible sponsor and champion and Women Talk Design like exists. I went to um, one of the kind of weekend series that you do where you craft your first talk. And then um, from there, it grows into opportunities to be able to do lightning talks or to be able to show up at the Designers and Geeks event um, that you do an intersection with every year. Um, and so there was kind of this tipping point where between um, getting to co uh, curate for UX week, um, the last year that we had it when I was at Capital One, um, all the way through Women Talk Design events, I feel like there was this tipping point that happened where then people started to reach out to me um, and ask for me to come and speak. And yeah, and now it's kind of exciting because people are able to reach out and I'm able to assess like, does that make sense? Does it not? Um, but also even more exciting is being able to raise other people's hands um, and attach them to opportunities if they don't make sense for me. 
Awesome. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about your experience curating because I think it's a really interesting perspective to um, be on the speaking side, but then also know mm -hmm. what goes into selecting speakers and helping prepare them. Um, but first, I'd love to talk more about uh, your recent keynote at SF Design Week. I know that you talked about, you know, if I had more time to prepare, this is what maybe I would have do, done differently. And if you can just share with us, um, you know, about that experience, what was it, it was like, uh, how you prepared any of that, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, the radical thing about that is I worked the women talk design process like you can come up with a talk relatively quickly by using like those. Um, I think I even said this to you when I came to that first weekend uh, series with you um, that basically like I was coming there to work out all of the scattered like back of napkin scratches that I had been collecting over some time to like build into a talk. Um, and essentially that's what happened with the SF Design Week talk. The um, Don had reached out who was organizing the event and they know that they wanted to start off acknowledging um, the state of the world. And basically because it's a community, um, it's based on community submissions, they didn't have any real way of kind of preempting what was happening in America at the same time as they were also putting together an event. And so they reached out and they said, can you, like, would you be willing to open and would you be willing to like, you know, take us to task and explicitly just um, set the tone for what we hope that people go through during this week. And so um, I had been already kind of uh, noodling on how to sense make of the world for myself and I went with what was relevant for me, which I think landed well with others. Um, again, I think that, you know, I immediately finished it. And with any talk, like they're never done and they're never perfect. Like they're, they always need to, you end. And then you're like, I wish that I had done something completely differently. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, now, instead of feeling like, oh, you know, that was, not so great and I wish that I could do something differently in the future. I'm actually excited about the iteration process and excited about the ability to rev on that talk and realize that it was a moment in time, but it can continue to grow into something different. And yeah. That's awesome. So if you're organizing events, you know, you can reach out to Alana and ask her to <laughs> continue to, to build on that talk. Um, that's great. I'd love to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, being on the curation side. So I know mm -hmm. that you mentioned that you helped curate UX Speak, which um, was a, a really well-known conference. Unfortunately, it doesn't um, exist anymore, but um, it was you know, such a fantastic one. And now you're working with Rosenfeld Media on their design op summit. And so if you can talk a little bit about what's it, what it's like to be on the curation side, that would be really awesome. Yeah, I mean, curation is, um, is tough because it is, I mean, so much project management needs to happen to kind of keep the ball rolling, especially our last UX week, we did four separate theme tracks. And then we did two full days of keynotes and then workshops throughout. And as I'm sure all of you know, um, you know, speaking is different than facilitating a workshop and adjusting content accordingly. And then also making sure that, you know, within those themes, we're having a diverse representation of the world and of the work that we are attempting to solve as designers coming together. Um, so curation is, is tough. But I will say that I have noticed in the spheres that I've been in, I've been a bit of a newcomer. Um, and I do get the sense that before my joining, there is very much this, you know, comfy, cozy network of designers. And they would very much just tap the shoulders of their friends who they know do good content. And that's why you would see kind of the same people showing up at conferences year over year. Um, and so it's very much been my MO to reach out to folks who I know are um, thinking on something tough or interesting or gritty and might just need to even bounce an idea off of somebody to form it into a talk or form it into a workshop. Um, so I, I take my job as a curator incredibly seriously. Like it's one thing that I really actually appreciate about the Rosenfeld Summit is if you once submissions are done in a way that we don't know who submitted them as we're piecing together the days. And then also you're given like coaching support and subject matter expert support as you are advancing towards the date of your talk. And I think that that's how like 
all curation boards should work. And it was certainly how I worked on UX week. I don't know if the other curators did the same thing, but I definitely went in that way. Awesome. That's great. Uh, we're going to open it up to Q&A in just a bit because we really want to make sure that you can have your questions um, answered. And so if you want to start thinking about what questions you have for Alana, either as being a speaker or curator or anything else, she's done so many amazing things. Um, you can start to think about those. You can even start to drop them in the chat um, and then we'll call on you to um, unmute and, and share. Um, Alana, one of the questions that I'm going to be asking all of our speakers in this series um, is about the advice that you might have for um, folks who are just getting started speaking or, you know, searching for the confidence to speak mm. up. And this can either be advice that you were given um, or, you know, Know, advice that you've just learned along the way. I'd love if you could share that. It's a muscle. Like it's a learned skill. It is a thing that you practice and get better at. And so lean into whatever the first opportunity is to just get started. I think that I also learned from your wisdom that nobody has your unique worldview. Nobody has um, exactly what, like kind of your way of thinking about the world. And so Thus, nobody has heard the talk that you have yet to give. And so just get started. Um, just you know, show up to lightning talk events, show up to opportunities, reach out to folks who are um, interested in, um, I don't know, helping craft stories and ideas with you. Um, I'm really lucky to have a group of folks. I see Rachel on the call, Heather Young on the call, who are, are both, um, you know, part of my board of advisors who will absolutely pick up the phone if I'm like, does this make any sense? Like what was wonderful about preparing for SF Design Week is how many of my friends picked up the phone that weekend to just run through the talk and Probably like on this call, there represents a spectrum of people who uh, met up with me when things were in post-it note form all the way through when I was ready to start timing the actual talk itself. Um, so my advice is just get started. There is no such thing as a perfect talk. When you see Brene Brown on Netflix and it's this beautiful scripted show, know that she has spent hours rehearsing that. And she has spent hours iterating on it. And she has a board of advisors. She talks openly about how much she runs things by her husband and, um, and friends and like crafts that talk over time. Um, and the only way to get better at it is to just practice. Um, and uh, if you can like work through with your friends, like head on like worst case scenarios and realize that like the chance that those things actually happen is relatively low. Awesome. That's such great advice. I love that. Thanks, Alana. Um, I see that there's some questions coming in the chat, which I love. If you are um, able to, I think it would be great to have uh, whoever is asking a question unmute and, and ask themselves so you all don't need to just hear from me. Um, Vivian, I know that you asked the first question about um, CFPs. Do you want to unmute and introduce mm -hmm. yourself and ask uh, the question to Alana? Yes. Hi, Alana. I'm loving everything that you are sharing at the moment. Um, the first question that I asked was, um, I know that diversity is a topic where at the moment when, when it comes to CFPs, but I still see a lot of CFPs that aren't really inviting diversity. And what is it that you would like to see them to do to attract diverse people? Mm. I mean, I think first and foremost, I mean, it has to start from the curation boards themselves. Like there has to be, um, as, I, and I actually just provided this direct feedback to Lou as he's thinking about the Rosenfeld um, kind of umbrella. And I said to him, like, on one hand, I mean, one hand, which you already know, you have to diversify those who are kind of the curation boards, which he's been working towards. But then I also made it very clear that, like, <clears throat> where diversity and particularly marginalized communities are at the center, you have to center the things that I care about and you have to center the challenges of my community so that it makes it make sense and worth my while that I am spending time thinking about how to solve the issues of my work and also of the world simultaneously. And I feel like until conferences start to also center the challenges of the world and not just um, pretend as though like, <laughs> 
nothing is wrong <laughs> then they won't attract like i don't i basically said to him like i don't have the time like when we look at something like the maslow's hierarchy of needs right and we think about safety and security as being that very bottom rung until mm -hmm. i have that for my community like i really can't navel gaze with you at a conference um, and so my recommendation has been, again, diversify the curation boards, but also take stances as conferences themselves and give us opportunities to work on the problems of the world and the problems of our work simultaneously. They are not, like for us, they are not, they are inextricably linked. Thank you. Awesome, thank you for that first question, Vivian. Um, next we have Alexis, do you want to ask your question? Sure, I can go. Good morning, Alana. I wanted to hear more about um, the work that you do with Interact Project, because I know you do, <laughs> and your IP is behind the screen cheering you on. Uh, so we just wanted to say thank you, but could you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, huge fan of IP. Um, I got the really great fortune of um, having been at Capital One, where um, at the time that I was there, there was a design pro bono program run by Anel Muller and Jenny Kempson. And um, what was great about Capital One is that um, they allowed us to, as designers, devote some time of our craft to also working with organizations that we champion. And so um, we were able to do a really um, awesome project where we worked with Josephine and um, a, like Mark and Daniel to basically um, look at what happens for um, the kids that go through IP um, and kind of how they can manage their portfolios and organize them in a way that land really well with recruiters uh, for universities or potentially getting them into um, other art programs. Um, and IP, if you don't know about it, Interact, I-N-N-E-R-A-C-T, Pro, uh, project um, is a, just a really great organization founded by Maurice Woods that um, creates kind of core design education for students um, from middle school all the way up through high school. And let me tell you that the curriculum of the program is, as somebody who put together curriculum uh, for adults um, is incredible. And what Mo and the team have built is awesome. Um, was super stoked that SF Design Week spent so much time amplifying them. Um, and whenever they need me, call me. Awesome. Thanks, Alexis and Alana. Yeah. Uh, Kanika or Kanika, I, do you want to share your question? Hi, I'm Kanika. Thanks, Danielle. I'm sorry, I also need to jump in three minutes. So, no um, but I was just curious when you do start. Um, Right at the beginning of your process, when you're trying to identify what topic it is you're moving forward with, what does that process look like for you? I'm sure there are a number of topics that excite you and you want to talk about, but how do you really drill down into what it is you end up delivering? Mm. I mean, it's a lot of my walls, probably much to my husband's chagrin, start to look like a beautiful mind with like post-it notes everywhere. Um, and I mean, that's one thing that I have done since the very beginning of designing, uh, you know, content for facilitation all the way up through talks is close my computer. At a certain point, I might do a little bit of research, but then I set a deadline for myself and say, you know, this is the cutoff point. At the end of the day, I could follow threads forever, but that will drive me mad. Um, and so I set a cutoff point, I close my computer and I really go analog with it. And I give myself an opportunity to just like go wild and crazy and just jot down post-it notes and, and proliferate. And then at a certain point, and I do, I like set actual timers for myself, then decide to call the fold and then start to add some order to it. Um, and honestly, the magic really happens when I start actually involving people in my process and that first or second time is like so embarrassing to like run through the the direction of a talk but then that's where the magic happens like that's where somebody else actually adds their two cents or their um a story or an anecdote or a quote and then all of a sudden like no talk that I've given, if I'm being honest with you, is 100% mine. Like it benefits from the tapestry of people giving feedback and editing and sharing. And I think that that's also a great way to think of it is like frame shift and realize that like, 
putting together a talk as a collaborative activity. Um, and so then you feel less alone because you are less alone. Thank you. I love that. I know uh, Heather had a follow up question for that. Yes, Alana, as you know, I'm just in awe of you. I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about how you fit these kind of extracurricular commitment, like speaking and, you know, working with the conference um, in to your life alongside your other personal and professional commitments, both practically and like emotionally how that feels for you. <laughs> um, I definitely feel like I hit walls where I um, have to say no. And I think that that's really empowering is to realize like what your limits are. Um, what I'm finding I say yes to right now, kind of my rubric is like, is it good for me? Is it good for like everybody? Is it in some way creating equity or joy in this world? And, um, put, you know, hopefully even justice. And if so, then like, yes, I will do that thing. Um, and if it doesn't serve those pieces, then I don't do it. Um, like tactically, it's shamefully nights, weekends, trying to do before work, trying to do after work. But what I also find, which I um, responded earlier, like I also am very, very fortunate right now to be working for freight, which I feel like is also solving the problems of the world in a way that intersects with the way that I also want to solve problems for my community. Um, and so I also hope then that speaking engagements or um, curation to some degree supports that. So in this case, you know, serving at, on the design ops curation board also benefits Uber and like identifying Uber as a place where design ops is a thriving practice. It's an opportunity to, um, to amplify who we are and, and the work that Dan Cooney and his team has been doing for some time. Um, but yeah, it, it is also additional time above and beyond my traditional work day, which I don't necessarily recommend, but um, it's easy enough to do when it's something that, um, that serves that internal rubric that I identified. But also, I think I loved Shonda Rhimes a few years ago wrote this book called The Book of Yes. And at first glance, I was like, oh, that's horrible. Like, don't say yes to everything. That's no good. And the way she described it is like, I spent a year of saying yes to only the things that like gave me pleasure or that I like wanted to do. Like I stopped saying yes to just everything. And I didn't say also no to things that, you know, drove fear in me. Um, and I think that hearing that was really important. So like just radically saying yes and embracing things wholeheartedly that you know will either cause you to grow, feed you uh, creatively, et cetera, but also like knowing when you don't need to do something is also important. And coffee. Lots of coffee. Awesome. Um, again, I encourage you all to add questions in the chat. We really want uh, these questions to be driven by you. Uh, if you want to let us know what you want to ask Alana. I know Vivian had another question. So Vivian, if you want to unmute and uh, chime in with your next question. So hi, Alana. My next question is, um, I know that there are a lot of speaking engagements where it's all about the visibility and all about the extra stuff. So putting yourself out there so that other people can approach you. But I also know that there are paid events, even if it's a minimal fee that speakers get. Where do you find them or do they approach you? Uh, where is it that you can look for these engaging events? Yeah, I mean, I do, I definitely do feel whether it's right or wrong that at the very beginning as you're getting started, you know, you may do a couple of events um, and think of them as training for yourself, like where you might not actually collect a fee. And then there's this tipping point that happens where you have done, you know, your first stage talk or your first conference talk. And then I think that um, what is incredible and what's awesome about belonging to this community is like, you are connected with a group of speakers where you can start to talk about like, how much should I be asking? And I think that one, a really amazing thing that Women Talk Design has been really at the core of over the past few years is making sure that people know that if you're going to host a conference, <clears throat> I realize academic conferences are kind of a whole other thing that I um, have not participated in curating, that they should expect to pay speakers. 
And I will say on the curation side, like there is a delicate balance between needing to pay. I mean, now we don't need to while we're in COVID times, but like <clears throat> needing to pay for facilities and uh, lighting and all of these different things. And there is a delicate balance um, of uh, that math of like getting people to pay for speakers and then paying folks who mm -hmm. um, come and speak. But I do think that like once you do those first couple of talks, like definitely set a set a time for yourself. Like I will do one 30 minute talk. And then after that, I will start asking for payment or I will start asking what they offer. I think what's also remarkable is I've witnessed how sometimes people get invited to speak and never even ask if compensation is provided. Mm -hmm. And like, you would be pretty surprised at how often the math works out where like the curator is fully prepared to pay and the speaker just doesn't know that that's even offered. So I definitely think, you know, even early on building up that muscle of just saying, and is there compensation? Like that should not be a loaded question. That should just be part of standard working things out, logistics emails at the beginning. Thank you. Great, thanks Vivian. Uh, Laura, do you wanna ask your question? Yes, uh, hello, I, Alana, thank you for being here. It just to me seems like a talk is never really totally done. So I wonder how do you know when it's ready or at least good enough to share? Mm. I think, you know, once you get to a place where it feels like your edits as you're rehearsing with different people, like the edits start to slow down. Like there's kind of this like Mount Everest that you get to the peak of when your edits are coming in at the beginning. And then there's this kind of like, oh, well, what if you tweaked the pacing? Or what if you just tweaked pausing? Like there gets, you get to notice a time where that tail of uh, feedback is just um, much more in the minutia, but like still helpful minutia. And that's a bit about, that's about where then all of a sudden it does make sense to start to give it to a broader audience versus just one-on-one -on -one or just for, to a few friends at a time, because then there's nothing that quite uh, approximates like the adrenaline of being on a stage, a virtual stage now, um, and then having just the feedback of the audience. Like it's amazing how, um, what's really cool is you like a release a talk, right? And then there's just this like panoply, this like v wide variety of emotional reactions to what you've said and things will surprise you. And I think that that, um, yeah, I think that at a certain point you just, Again, you get to that long tail of feedback and then you realize like push it to a whole audience and start to have fun with it that way. Yeah. Great. Uh, Don had a question about presenting in a more um, different type of setting. So Don, do you want to chime in? Hi there. Hi everyone. Um, I wanted to ask a question about sort of day-to-day -day life. I, I work in an enterprise setting actually for a rather large uh, healthcare company and I give talks to executives, stakeholders, and even the working teams on a regular basis. So oftentimes the meetings will be everything from a designer that's right on the team all the way to like the VP of um, engineering. So a, a wide base of, of people who sort of take the ideas in. And, and in these scenarios, the talk is, is often exposed to discussion at a minimum, um, debate, often interruptions and questions and even criticism in real time. And I'm curious how you've adapted your skills in presenting at a formal event uh, to speaking in your day-to-day -day professional life. Yeah, I think that's where I am just so grateful to have started as a facilitator and then grew into a speaker because um, I, I interviewed somebody recently um, who was joining our team and he um, put it so succinctly, like his goal is to put the pens in the hands of leaders and that kind of flipping that on its head. And I think that even now as we're like virtual, it's even more important to invite interactivity and even more invite participation. Like everybody is multitasking. It's really hard for them to like maintain. I think that, um, there, there have been some research studies that like adults can listen for about 10 minutes to the same speaker. Um, and so I think that like using, like leaning on facilitation tricks to invite them into this process and have them realize that like, 
oh, if you think you can do it better or you think you can give criticism, like do so, but like do so in a way that's productive and not just tearing things down. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I, I think across the board, like leaning into um, facilitation or even improv, like, skills right now and, and best practices, um, I think are incredibly helpful for like transitioning for presenting internally. That's interesting. Thank you for that. I, I would be curious to learn some more around some of those facilitation techniques because I, I think I've, I've dipped into that a bit of trying to get that engagement um, and recognizing, you know, through empathy and like people starting to type or mute or turn their camera off that they're checking out a little bit in certain instances or they're the few that, that have the hangers on because they have to get their point across. Um, so I'd be curious to, to know more about specific techniques that have, that have worked for you in this, this remote environment. Um, it, it, you know, it, I'm happy to go through the other questions too. It's just, yeah. I would love to know some tactical yeah. options. Tactically, I mean, I would just like restate the intention of the meeting. I think that right now um, what we're doing is like refiguring out how to communicate to one another. Like I think Women Talk Design had a really great, um, I forget who Danielle had the article that talks about how we used to get onto stage and start with a story. And now we kind of need to get on virtual stage and start with a question. And I feel as though um, we need to think about like, why do we convene virtually? And I feel like when this pandemic first started and all of a sudden our teams went distributed, we just tried to pretend like life was normal and carry on, but now virtually. And it's clear that this is going to go for some time. And so we need to think about like, why do we meet? And if um, you know we are guilty at freight of sending each other really long decks and then convening over them and somebody presents and um, I think we're all coming to the realization that that doesn't make a t whole ton of sense. So how can we send the deck in advance and then identify clearly like what does it, what magic is it of the people who are invited to this agenda that we need to work through together and how will we do that and then to put on your facilitators hat to think like what are the activities that will help move us forward. Um, but gone are the days of like presenting and having all of the nuance that goes into planning that presentation entirely land with your audience. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm looking for that article and I'll drop it in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, R. Postman, do you want to share your question? Hi, Alana. Um, I have a question about imposter syndrome. And um, I'm, I'm guessing that you have had it, but maybe not. I'm wondering if you have, uh, how to get through that and how you kind of get through the, like I get in my head thinking like, oh, I have nothing new to add to this mm. conversation, um, but maybe that's not true. So how have you dealt with that in your career? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, again, it's the, it's the process of doing it and showing up and realizing that like, when people come up to you after talks or after panels, et cetera, like they pull into some piece of your history or messaging that you didn't even realize was important. And you start to realize like, oh, I actually have had this tapestry that nobody else has had. Like, I am very lucky to know Rachel who's asking me this question right now. And you have this like totally unique, awesome, uh, career that has added up to exactly this moment where you are. And I think that, any way that you would splice that and form a talk would be something completely unique and new. Um, and I would just encourage, I think just the practice of showing up, like over time sheds that imposter syndrome. So speak on more panels than at conferences, please. That's great advice. Asena, do you wanna share your question? Yeah, I, um... I'm having some technical issues, so I might have to go back to non-video, but yeah. um, I was just wondering if you've ever done anything pre-recorded, kind of like in this Zoom or remote work space. Um, I've heard from a lot of people just like how hard it is to get that audience feedback. Mm. <clears throat> and so I'm just wondering if you've played around at all and then like been available for question and answer. I was just kind of wondering if I'm just curious about that because as a someone who is dipping my toe in the water as far as like exploring 
um, talking. Um, it seems like a little bit of an easier entry, if you will. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering if you had done anything like that. Yeah, it's hard. I have not done anything like that yet. I've heard that um, of people who I very much respect who are thinking about that kind of a methodology, because if I'm being honest with you, um, SF Design Week was rough because I knew that there was a chat panel, like there's these really great broadcast platforms and even this Zoom has a chat panel, but like talking, listening, reading are all conflicting activities. And like we, <laughs> like short, like even though I see drivers attempting to text while driving, like we've not evolutionarily like caught up with our technology to be going in all places all the time. Um, and so I don't have, like, I basically will not look at a chat. I will definitely rely on Danielle or others who are facilitating me to say like, Hey, there's a question and prompt it. Um, I think that pre-recorded could work. I do think that again, we go back to the, like, what is the magic of us all being together at a certain time? And that, that I think is like, maybe that's what I'm noodling next is like, why do we meet? as we're like thinking about going back into offices or thinking about having virtual conferences, like why do we come together? What is the magic of that? Um, and I do, I haven't really quite reconciled like what a pre-recorded video within Q and A might feel like, um, especially with just making sure that like people stop to actually receive the content, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know, I haven't solved that one yet. That's a good one. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you everyone so much for your questions and thank you Alana for your very thoughtful answers. Um, I am so glad to have you all here for our first speaker stories and as part of this we really wanted to give you all a chance to connect as well um, and just to have a short amount of time to be able to say hello, uh, share what you learned, share kind of where you are in, in your speaker journey. And so um, we saved the last 10 to 15 minutes of um, this session to um, have some breakout rooms and to be able to connect uh, with other people. I have a couple of questions you can use to start off your conversation. If you're not able to stay, that's okay. Um, I'm actually too going to stay in here um, and I'll invite Alana to stay as well if you didn't have a chance to have your question answered. But I do encourage you to um, hop into a room, say hello to someone new, share where you are in your journey, and, um, and then we'll all come back together for the last um, minute or so to close things out. So um, please join me in thanking Alana in case uh, you do have to go. Um, huge shout out to um, her, her for being here. Um, I also too will send out afterwards a feedback survey. This is our first edition of um, this event and we're gonna be continuing to do them weekly. So we wanna make sure that um, we have your feedback so we can continue to adapt um, and improve. Our next one next week is with Corley Rosario um, who was someone who came to me and said, you know, a lot of people are coming to me asking, how do I first get started? Um, how do I have that first speaking engagement and really helped, um, you know, uh, kick off that initial, uh, we should, we should do this series. So um, I'll bring everyone back together just before um, 10 a.m. Pacific to, to say goodbye. But for now, I'm setting up the breakout rooms. And like I said, I invite you um, to join it if, if you can. And then these are um, some quick kind of starting questions I'll put in the chat right now um, that you can ask each other. Um, and the rooms are open.